I'm Kelly, and this is The Woman Condemned, where we talk about women on death row and those serving life. It's also the only place you'll hear their words directly from their mouth. Today, we're going to talk about the mystery of Mean Marie. Back in the 60s, Marie Arrington was quite a character. She was in trouble a lot. She did a lot of crappy stuff. But the murder of a local legal secretary in her town <clears throat> was blamed on her. A lot of it, I think, had to do with the fact that she had such a bad reputation. She'd done a lot of mean, horrible stuff. A lot of evidence points to the fact that she was telling the truth in court, but there are some unexplainable things, so I can't wait to hear what you have to say. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing. I could really use it, and I'd really appreciate it. Also, hit that like button and click on the notification bell if you want to see videos when they first come out. Okay, let's get started with Mean Marie. Marie gave a few interviews in her heyday, but never discussed her childhood, nor will her relatives or friends divulge any of her past. We know she was born in 1933, and from testimony from a friend of her mother's, we know she was a wild child that misbehaved, who grew into a hellcat of a woman who partied hard and was involved with many men. Her criminal history was lengthy, and she was well acquainted with local law enforcement. She was arrested for forgery in 1955. In 56, she was convicted of assault. In 57, she was convicted of robbery and larceny. She took a short break, and then in 61, she was convicting of passing worthless checks. Another short break, and she was back at it in 64 with a vehicle theft, larceny, and manslaughter conviction after she shot her husband. By the time she reached age 34, Leesburg attorney Bob Pierce had called her the meanest woman he had ever known, and headlines labeled her a murderess without a conscience. It was what happened in 1968 that earned her these titles. In late April of 1968, Leesburg Legal Secretary June Ritter was kidnapped in broad daylight from the office of her boss, attorney Bob Pierce. Nothing was overturned. There was no evidence of struggle. Two days later, police find Mrs. Ritter's car. Blood spattered in the trunk and taillight wires pulled out set the community on its ear. Three days later, June Ritter's body is found by searchers. She'd been shot in the head and neck several times and run over with the car. Detective work uncovered a few witnesses. More than one said they last saw Miss Ritter with a large black woman. They picked up Marie for questioning, and she gave a whole slew of stories and alibis that didn't check out before finally saying that she did know what happened. When she was fighting her own it. legal battles, Marie was heavily involved in those of her two children, Francina and Lloyd, both of whom Mr. Pierce had also represented in their two respective trials, which turned out really bad. Francina got two years of hard labor at age 18 for writing bad checks. Uh, Marie's son, Lloyd, was sentenced to life for armed robbery at 19. Marie told authorities that she had went to Mr. Pierce's office that day, but not to kidnap anybody. She went to discuss uh, her children's cases. She said she walked in on the abduction of Miss Ritter by a very large black woman and two or three black guys. 
she told police that they had left June in an orange grove and drove her back to Leesburg with the warning that if she told anyone, she would be killed and her family would be killed. Police searched Marie's apartment and found an envelope under her bathtub that contained June's watch, car keys, and a letter hand-printed in pencil. It stated that in two weeks' time, three incarcerated young men needed to be released or the police would start receiving body parts of Mrs. Ritter's, beginning with the arm that was the wearing the watch. Police didn't just find the envelope. Marie took them to the envelope. She showed it to them. She said the kidnappers left it on her bed and she hid it. There were other notes found later. Mr. Pierce was sure Marie did it. He said she was the only one in town mean enough to do it. Here's where it gets interesting. The state ran tests with the FBI on the handwriting of all the notes. They decided that Marie probably did not write the notes, so they tested 16 of her friends and family members. None of them wrote the notes either. That may have helped her out more than it did if Marie's own sister hadn't have put the kibosh on that whole innocence thing. She told police that Marie had, in the past, more than once, perfectly replicated her signature and could do it to anyone's signature. Another interesting fact, none of Marie's hair or fingerprints were found on Mrs. Ritter's car. There were no fibers of Mrs. Ritter's on anything of Marie's. They had no murder weapon, and the one fingerprint they could find on the car was unidentified. Marie took a polygraph test, but considering she admitted knowing so much about the crime already, it was inconclusive. Most of this information comes from um, an interview in 2012 that Marie gave to Gary Corsair. And the photos, most of the photos come from lakeandsumpter.com as a part of his article. When she gave her version to Mr. Corsair in 2012, it was basically the same. She said she went to the lawyer's office and when she got there, the crime was in progress. They drove to an orange grove where they shot Mrs. Ritter and threatened Marie, put her back in the car, and took her back to town. She says then, for the first time, that she noticed a man named Joe Fairfax there, who was a local drug dealer who she had worked for. She saw his car there. She only mentioned that for the first time in 2012 because she assumed everyone was dead. She said she was deathly afraid of this man and that he could have killed her and everybody that she knew. And she had been working for him. She was a, she did all kinds of stuff for him, ran errands and collected money and uh, she was involved in counterfeiting, etc. During her trial in 1968, there were three witnesses called. Two said they saw Mrs. Ritter with a black woman driving her car and her in the passenger side. The third witness said he saw Marie herself driving Mrs. Ritter's car and tried to follow her, but he lost track of her. Okay, so we find out Joe Fairfax, the drug dealer who Marie worked for, local con, owned a car identical to Mrs. Ritter. Marie claims she was working for Joe Fairfax at the time, driving his car. So this third witness could have seen her driving Joe Fairfax's car. All three witnesses performed really badly. and They all admitted that they weren't really, really sure what they saw. They couldn't be 100% sure what they saw. The jury was more excited about the handwritten notes and things found in Marie's apartment than they were what the witnesses had to say, but they never got a chance to hear the uh, expert testimony about the handwriting analysis. And Officer Hutton 
also testified against Marie, saying that he had found a screen door slashed at a judge's house who was connected to the case and a pile of human waste on the floor. One of Marie's fingerprints was found on that judge's car, and the jury took note of that as well. The defense called no witnesses. Marie was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. She was intended to be the first woman in Florida executed by the electric chair. But she wasn't. She escaped. Marie escaped from Lowell Correctional Institution for Women. It baffled everyone. She just disappeared and the dogs couldn't even detect her. As she explained in 2012, saying, Two men in masks led her out of her cell and out the front door to a waiting car. She stayed in churches and barns for a few nights before heading right back to Leesburg. She went into hiding in Montclair, about three miles away. A $5,000 reward was offered for her capture, but she was soon the second woman ever on the FBI Most Wanted list. Two years passed. Marie put Leesburg behind her, but Bob Pierce could never forget her. He ordered phone taps on her family and friends. When Marie's minister got a call from Louisiana, they finally got the lead they were looking for. They traced the call to a phone booth and find Marie waiting tables at a nearby diner under the name Lola Nero. After 34 months, she was rearrested on December 23rd, 1971. Marie tried another unsuccessful escape after 11 months, but then gave in for the long haul. She may have been resigned to her fate, but she was still angry. Between 1984 and 2010, she spent over a thousand days in solitary and got more than 50 disciplinary actions, mostly for contraband and disobeying While she was regulations. On the, run, the Supreme Court enacted a moratorium on the death penalty. Evidence has cropped up over the years that back up Marie's claims of the wildlife that she lived and all the things that she did with Joe Fairfax and the fact that she could possibly be telling the truth. Her relationship with Joe Fairfax included a counterfeit money scheme that stretched all the way as far as Chicago and New York. She also had some connection to Harlan Blackburn, a Lake County, Florida known crime boss. She's believed to have taken part in everything from counterfeiting to drugs and murder for hire. In the 2012 interview, Marie did finally say Mrs. Ritter was killed due to her husband's involvement with Harlan and the counterfeit money plates. Unfortunately, none of these things can be proven because everybody's already dead. Marie's chance of being proven innocent died along with everyone else involved in this case. There's no doubt mean Marie came by her name honest. But did she kill Mrs. Ritter? I don't think so. Marie claimed innocence and stuck by it until she died in 2014.